right, everyone. Welcome back to chapter 11. This is our second lecture of the nervous system fundamentals. And hopefully before starting this, you have gone back to chapter three and kind of reviewed a little bit about the uh, things like the sodium potassium pump, the sodium and potassium concentrations, things like that that we talked about back in chapter three, because that's going to play a very important role in today's lecture. So let's go ahead and start with our not really attendance questions. What does polar mean? What does it mean if a membrane is permeable to something? Where is the greater concentration of sodium? Is it outside the cell or inside the cell? And how is this concentration achieved? And what is the axon hillock? So go ahead and pause the video, try to answer these because these will be playing a big role in today's lecture. Hopefully you've done that. Now let's see what the correct answers for these are. First, what does polar mean? Now this has come back a lot this semester. I told you early on that it would, so hopefully you're pretty used to this term now and we all know that it means one area of something has different properties than another area of something. So we're going to see polarity again today. Next, what does it mean if a membrane is permeable to something? Well, remember permeable means something can get through. So if a membrane is permeable to something, let's say sodium, it means that sodium can cross that membrane. And if no energy is used, which direction does something move if something is permeable to it? It will move from an area of high concentration towards an area of low concentration. That will be important today. Next, where is the greater concentration of sodium? Is it outside the cell or inside the cell? Remember, there's more sodium outside the cell than inside. There's a greater concentration of sodium on the outside of the cell. But how is that achieved? Because if there was more sodium outside the cell, and we know that the cell membrane is permeable to sodium, well, sodium is going to leak into the cell. It's going to move, it's going to diffuse, it's going to go from an area of high concentration towards an area of low concentration, it's going to keep coming into the cell. So how is there more sodium outside the cell? Remember the sodium potassium pump moved sodium from inside the cell to outside the cell using ATP. Hopefully that sounds familiar. Maybe not really familiar, but hopefully you at least remember talking about that a little bit. And lastly, what is the axon hillock? Remember the axon hillock was that kind of funnel shaped area right where the axon of a neuron meets with the soma, the cell body of a neuron. And we said the axon hillock in our last lecture was the structure that decided if an electrical signal would be sent into the axon away from the cell. So today, that's what our lecture is going to focus on. It's going to all be looking at how does that electricity work? How do those electrical signals work? What are those electrical signals? And why do we want them in our body? So the first little bit of this lecture is just how are neurons classified? And we classify neurons by their structure. What are they shaped like? and their function. What do they do? And that little bit, very brief, it's going to be self-study. So go ahead and fill that first little bit of this lecture out just from your reading. We are much more interested in the activities of neurons. Now before we do that, we're going to have a little bit of a review and a little bit of new information introducing some terms, and then we're going to dive deep into how neurons work. So first thing that we want to look at is voltage. What is voltage? We discussed this a little bit back in chapter three. Voltage is a separation of charged particles. A separation of charged particles. 
And when we talk about neurons, we say that the membrane has a voltage. There is more positive outside the membrane than there is inside the membrane. There is more positive outside the cell than inside. But the way that we usually say it is the inside of the cell membrane is more negative compared to the outside of the cell. The inside of the cell membrane is more negative compared to the outside of the cell. That does not mean that there are uh, there is a negative charge inside the cell. It does not mean that there is a positive charge outside the cell. Because if we look inside of a cell, there are equal positive and negative charges. A cell itself is uncharged. But the number of negative charges inside the cell is greater than the number of positive charges outside the cell. So the inside is more negative compared to the outside. Now, what about leaky channels? We discussed leaky channels back in chapter three. Leaky channels are channels in the cell membrane that are always open. And the different ones, the different types of leaky channels are permeable to different things. There are sodium channels that sodium and nothing else can pass through. There are potassium channels that potassium and nothing else can pass through. So a channel is specific to certain particles. Something we're going to learn about today are voltage gated channels. So while leaky channels are always open, voltage gated channels open and close in response to certain voltage levels. They are closed at certain voltages and they open at certain voltages. And just like the leaky channels, they are specific. When they are open, they are only open and permeable to specific particles. Next, ligand gated channels, sometimes also called chemically gated channels. Ligand gated channels and chemically gated channels are the same thing. These are kind of like a lock and key. It's a channel that is closed until a certain chemical, a certain ligand binds to it. And when that certain ligand binds to it, it's like putting a key in a lock. The channel will open. And when it is open, it is specific. Certain things can pass through it. And lastly, mechanically gated channels, we won't really talk about in our class, but I do want to mention them. Mechanically gated channels open and close in response to physical deformation. This is how touch receptors work. Normally they're closed, but if you touch something, it actually pushes on the mechanically gated channel, deforms them in such a way that they open up, and then when you stop touching something, they close. So here is one of those chemically gated or ligand gated channels. On the left, we see it is closed. Whatever ion it is that could pass through, it can't get through because the gate is closed. But over here, the ligand, the little green balls, we'll probably see that that is something called acetylcholine in our next lecture. When this ligand binds, it causes the gate to open. And now the ions can flow through from the area where they were in high concentration towards the area where they were in low concentration. So that is a ligand or a chemically gated channel. So I said this lecture was going to be about electricity. Let's talk about how electricity is generated. Well, we're going to have to refresh our minds on gradients. Remember, there were gradients that we talked about way back in chapter two, I believe, maybe chapter three. But we said there were concentration gradients, which we will see are also called chemical gradients. This is just where there is more of a substance in one area than there is in another area. There are electrical gradients. 
in an electrical gradient, there is more positive in one area than another, or more negative in one area than another. In an electrochemical gradient, there is both of those at once. Now, we're going to be talking a lot about charged particles. So, we're going to be talking about ions. Remember, ions were atoms that developed a charge because they either gained or lost an electron. We're going to be talking about sodium, which is in a plus. We'll be talking about potassium, which is K plus. We'll be talking about calcium, which is Ca2 plus or plus plus. Sometimes you'll see two plus, sometimes you'll see two plus signs. Chloride, which is Cl minus. Now, sodium has a higher concentration outside the cell. Potassium has a higher concentration inside the cell. Calcium has a higher concentration outside the cell. Remember, we said calcium, as a matter of fact, if it is inside the cell, it's locked away in that smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Does that sound familiar? Hopefully it does. Chloride has a higher concentration outside the cell. But then there's also proteins. Proteins are not atoms. Proteins are large molecules, but they tend to have a negative charge. So sometimes you will see them written as A negative. The A stands for anion. Remember, anion is a negative ion. And they have a higher concentration inside the cell. So we have different concentrations of different charged particles. We also said that sodium is higher outside the cell. We said that potassium is higher inside the cell. And all these different ones have different concentrations, either inside or outside the cell. But sodium and potassium, and to a lesser extent protein, are the ones that we're really going to be concerned with today. So I'm going to tell you that in our body, because of this uneven distribution of charged particles, the inside of our cells are negative compared to the outside of the cells. The outside of the cells are positive compared to the inside. We said that just a little bit ago. We've said that in previous lectures. The inside of the cell is more negative compared to the outside. The outside of the cell is less negative or more positive compared to the inside. Now, in different types of cells, we can be even more specific. If this were a neuron, we could measure just how negative it is. In a neuron, it's about negative 70 millivolts while at rest. If this were a muscle cell, it would be about negative 90 millivolts while at rest. So different cell types have different voltages applied to them while at rest. Some of them are higher, some of them are lower. Today we're concerned with neurons, so we will be talking a lot about negative 70 millivolts. And that negative 70 millivolts, I keep saying while at rest, because we will see that it changes depending on what's going on with the cell. But that negative 70 millivolts is an important number, and we will call that the resting membrane potential, or the R. M P, the resting membrane potential. Resting, because it's at rest. Membrane potential is a way of talking about voltage. So, since the inside of the cell has different properties than the outside, the inside of the membrane is more negative compared to the outside of the membrane, we say that that membrane 
has polarization or it is polarized. It is polar. And it is polar because of permeability. Potassium is constantly leaking out of the cell. Sodium is constantly leaking inside the cell. And the sodium-potassium pump is constantly moving sodium back out where it belongs and moving potassium back in where it belongs. And that is what sets up our negative 70 millivolt resting membrane potential. In different cells, they are more or less permeable to different ions. And that's why we have something like negative 90 millivolts in other cells. But that's where that membrane potential comes from. So, now let's look at what happens if we change the permeability. Let's say we have a neuron, which we can see over here on the left, and we have a voltimeter here measuring the membrane potential, the voltage across the membrane. We see our negatives inside, our positives outside, and since this is a neuron, we are at negative 70 millivolts. That's our resting potential. But what happens if we make this neuron more permeable to sodium? More permeable to sodium. Let's back up to refresh your memory. Sodium is higher outside the cell, right? And what does sodium do? Sodium leaks into the cell. Well, normally, at the regular permeability to sodium, we are at negative 70 millivolts. But if we make the cell more permeable to sodium, let's say we add more of those channels that let sodium through, what's going to happen? Well, more sodium is going to come into the cell. What kind of charge does sodium have? Sodium has a positive charge. And if positives are coming into the cell at a faster than normal rate, what's going to happen to this negative 70 millivolts? It's going to start to go upwards. It's going to go from negative 70 upwards. It's going to approach zero. It could potentially pass zero and become more positive inside the cell. Not necessarily, but it could just depending on how permeable we make it to sodium. That act of becoming less negative, remember normally we are negative 70 in a neuron. If we become less negative, we say we are depolarizing the cell. When we go from resting potential and we become less negative, we are depolarizing the cell. What if instead we made the cell more permeable to potassium? What if we put more of these potassium channels in the cell membrane. Well, potassium normally is leaking out of the cell, taking his positive charges with him. So if we had more potassium channels, more potassium would exit the cell. What would that do to this negative 70? Well, we are taking positive charges out of the cell, making the cell more negative on the inside. Here's our negative 70 resting potential, and all of a sudden, we're going to go more negative than rest. We are going to hyperpolarize the cell. We are going to make it more negative on the inside than it was before. It was polarized, now we're making it even more polarized. We are hyperpolarizing it. So by changing the permeability of a cell, we can make that membrane more or less polarized. 
we can generate voltage by separating charged particles. That is how electricity works inside of a cell. So let's draw now. I recommend having several sheets of paper with you. We're going to draw to see how neurons use this for communication. So I'm going to talk as you all draw this out. I'm going to explain what it is that we're looking at. We are looking at a point midway along the axon of a neuron. We are looking at something midway along the axon of a neuron. The blue line represents the plasma membrane, the neurolemma is what it's called, the plasma membrane of a neuron. The area above the blue line is outside the cell and the area below the blue line is inside the cell. The purple things are different types of proteins along that membrane. The first one over here on the left is a leaky sodium channel. It is always open. And if it is a leaky sodium channel, what goes through it? Sodium. The next one is a voltage-gated sodium channel. It opens and closes in response to specific voltages. When it is open, what goes through it? Sodium. Our leaky channel, we can see this line right here, represents the tube that goes through this channel. It's always open. The voltage-gated channel right now, we see it does not have that open line through it, so it's closed right now. Over here on the right side, we have a leaky potassium channel. That line represents it's open because it's always open. It's leaky. And if it's leaky and it's a potassium channel, what passes through it? Potassium. Potassium can always pass through here because it is a leaky potassium channel. Next to that is a voltage-gated potassium channel. We see that it is closed right now. We see that sodium is high outside the cell and low inside. We see that potassium is high inside the cell and low outside. And right here in the middle is the reason for that. Here is our sodium-potassium pump, and we can see down here attached is a molecule of ATP. So right now we're going to quickly draw what is always happening in this cell. So sodium is always leaking in. I've got the wrong color there. Sodium is always leaking in. Regardless of what else goes on, sodium is always leaking in. And potassium is always leaking out. Regardless of what else is happening, sodium is leaking in and potassium is leaking out. And the sodium potassium pump is constantly resetting everything. It takes a molecule of ATP and it takes two sodium, I'm sorry, three sodium and two potassium. It takes the three sodium and pushes them out. It takes the two potassium and pushes them in. Always regardless of what else is going on, these steps are always happening. Now, because those steps are always happening, if we look at our action potential graph, which is from our book, and we'll talk about what an action potential is in just a moment, we are right here. We are at rest. Resting membrane potential negative 70 millivolts 
at rest. All right, regardless of what else is going on in the cell, sodium is leaking in, potassium is leaking out, and the sodium-potassium pump is resetting everything. It's moving three sodiums out and two potassiums in. All right, I'm going to take a copy of this, if I could figure out how to make it work. There's our copy. And now we're going to see what happens when some things change. Right now, what we're going to say is something off to the left of the screen happens. And whatever it is that happens, and we'll see at the end what it is that's happening, it causes the inside of the cell to start to rise. It's going from negative 70 up to negative 65, up to negative 60, up to negative 55. If it does not get to negative 55 millivolts, nothing happens. But if this negative 70 does get to negative 55, if it becomes less negative, then we reach our first magic number, negative 55 millivolts. Negative 55 millivolts is called threshold. And it's our first we'll call magic number. At threshold, negative 55 millivolts, if we get there, there is no stopping what comes next. So, once we get to negative 55, something happens. What is it that happens? The voltage-gated sodium channel opens. Well, what does that mean? If the voltage-gated sodium channel opens, what have we just done? We have made the membrane more permeable to sodium. We did just have leaky sodium channels. Now we've got leaky sodium channels and voltage-gated sodium channels. So what's sodium going to do? It's going to continue coming in through the leaky, but now it can also come in through the voltage-gated sodium channels. What's that going to do? It's going to take that negative 55 and suddenly we're going to increase. We're going to continue to climb. We're going to go negative 55, negative 50, negative 45, negative 40, and we're going to keep climbing. We're going to get to negative 10, negative 5. We're going to get to zero, and we're going to keep going, bringing those positive charges in until we get to our next magic number, positive 30. That negative 55, we're going to make so much more positive that we're going to get to positive 30 millivolts. The inside of the cell has gone from more negative to more positive compared to the outside of the cell. We have flipped membrane voltage. We have gone from negative 70 to positive 30. That part where we are increasing in voltage, remember what that was called? Depolarization. We have depolarized the membrane. Once we get to positive 30 though, what happens? Well, at positive 30, let me change our drawing here just a little bit. We were open right here. Well, a couple of things happen. First, this weird little swing ball thing is going to immediately slam shut. That little wrecking ball looking guy, 
is called the inactivation gate on the voltage gated channel the inactivation gate so all that sodium that was rushing in it's going to keep trying to rush in but it can't the end of the, the channel there is plugged up so immediately we stop rising we do not go above positive 30 because at positive 30 the voltage gated channels inactivation gate slammed shut and it plugged the exit now meanwhile that sodium voltage gated channel is going to continue to squeeze shut it takes a while but it doesn't matter how long it takes because down here the inactivation gate is in place to block any sodium from coming through that's why we rise until we get to positive 30 but then immediately we stop rising because of the voltage gated sodium channels inactivation gate well that's at positive 30 but what happens aside from the voltage gated sodium channel closing well the next thing that happens is we're going to open the voltage gated potassium channel the voltage gated potassium channel opens so what is sodium i'm sorry what is potassium going to do potassium now has extra pathways out of the cell it continues to go out through the leaky channel but now it can go out through the voltage gated channel taking his positive charges with him so what's going to happen to the charge of the membrane it's going to start to drop it was at positive 30 but it's going to drop as potassium exits the cell it's going to get back down to threshold it's going to keep dropping it's going to get back down to negative 70 resting membrane potential now once we get to negative 70 a couple things happen first by this time the voltage gated sodium channel has finished closing its inactivation gate swings back down but also the voltage gated potassium channel slowly begins to squeeze shut but what's missing from the voltage gated potassium channel it does not have an inactivation gate so as it is squeezing shut slowly potassium can still move out of the cell not as fast as it was because it's squeezing shut but it does continue so we overshoot that negative 70. we get down to somewhere around negative 85 or negative 90 before it finishes closing at that point no more sodium can leak in no more potassium can leak out we're right back where we started however we're now down in this low area we have repolarized the cell but we overshot we got more polar than before so we have hyper polarized the cell meanwhile the sodium potassium pump is moving everybody back into place and finally we come back up to resting membrane potential that entire thing takes fractions of fractions of a second just over one millisecond or one one thousandth of a second 
the whole thing from resting membrane potential through depolarization, through repolarization, hyperpolarization, and back to rest is called an action potential. An action potential is a brief reverse of membrane potential. A brief reverse or reversal of membrane potential. We went from more negative on the inside to more positive and back to more negative. That is an action potential. Well, why is this important? Let's zoom out a little bit. First thing I said was something off to the left. Let me get another color here. Let's use green so it doesn't match anything. We had said that something originally off to the left hand side of the screen happened and caused this kind of slight increase. What was it that happened? Well, it was everything that we just drew on here because I said this was midway along an axon. Off to the left is towards the soma in this image. Off to the right is towards the axon terminal. So we are sending the signal that direction. How do we send the signal? Well, what we have drawn here is going to repeat hundreds of thousands of times down the length of the axon. It happened off screen to the left and when we were up here, when we were very, very depolarized, when we were about positive 30, well all of those positives started influencing this area. It caused the voltage-gated sodium channel to open. Now this area becomes more positive. And when this area has a lot of positives, it's going to influence the next set of proteins in line to become closer to positive. It's like knocking over a domino. You knock that first one over, it's going to knock the second one over, it's going to knock the third one over. So if we thought about how does a neuron look, let's draw a quick neuron. We have our soma with the dendrites. We have our axon hillock. We have our axon, and then we have our axon terminals. what we just looked at was right there but it repeats right here and right here and right here and right here so something happened up here that caused this guy to become more positive when that happened it caused the neighboring area to become more positive which caused the neighboring area to become more positive and eventually it travels all the way down the axon towards the axon terminals so the action potential, not only is it a brief reversal of charges in one area, action potentials are able to be propagated. That means passed along. So when there is an action potential that begins here at the axon hillock, we will see how that begins in our next lecture. But when there is an action potential there, it will travel the entire length of the axon. Well, when it gets to the end, what then? That's the topic of our next lecture. But we know that at the end of that, there's going to probably be another neuron or maybe a muscle. But whatever it is, we're going to pass that action potential off to the next cell in line who is then going to send the action potential along its surface as well. So action potentials are passed along the length of a cell and ultimately to the next cell in line. 
we are sending electricity very similar to how we send electricity through wires. All right, let's get back to our PowerPoint. So action potentials. Every single action potential in a neuron goes from negative 70 to positive 30 and back to negative 70. Every action potential does that. So how does a neuron send a weak signal versus a strong signal? How does your brain know if you are lightly touching something or firmly touching something? If something is poking you softly or if something is poking you sharply and hard? How does your brain know the difference between one action potential and another? How does it know if a signal is going to be very gentle or very intense? If they all go from negative 70 to positive 30 and back. Well, they all have the same amplitude. They go from 70, sorry, negative 70 to 30 and back. Well, it's not amplitude of the action potential, it's frequency of the action potential. If action potentials come slowly, da, 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 or if action potentials come quickly, da, 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 da. So if something does not reach threshold, if it is not a strong enough a stimulus to generate an action potential in a neuron, well, there's nothing. If there is a weak stimulus, just enough to hit threshold, well, we get very slow action potentials. If there is a strong stimulus, well above threshold, we get very fast action potentials. So let's kind of give that some real world stuff. If there is a quiet noise, if there is a loud noise. Now this is not high pitch, low pitch. This is loud or not as loud. So quiet, loud, soft light, bright light, soft touch, punch, or firm touch. So the strength of the stimulus determines the frequency of the action potentials. But even though there is a faster frequency or a higher frequency of action potentials, there does come a point where action potentials have a speed limit, basically. They cannot go faster. And that time is called the refractory period. Here we're at rest, here the stimulus comes and we depolarize, we get to the peak and now we start to repolarize. And during this time, the cell is not capable of generating another action potential. One, because the ions are out of place, and two, because that voltage-gated sodium channel inactivation gate is closed. That period where we cannot send another action potential is called the absolute refractory period. The absolute refractory period, we cannot send another action potential. Now, once that voltage-gated sodium channel inactivation gate is open, it's back down, and once the ions are starting to shift back into place, it's difficult, but not impossible, to send another action potential. During this time, for the rest of the repolarization, through hyperpolarization, and back to rest, if it is a really, really strong signal, we can send another action potential. It has to be a very strong stimulus but we can, and that's called the relative refractory period. After that time, well, we're back to resting membrane potential, so any stimulus that reaches threshold 
can cause another action potential. But absolute refractory period, no action potential is possible. Relative refractory period, an absolute, I mean, a, a action potential can be generated if the stimulus is strong enough. Well, what about the conduction velocity? How quickly does the action potential travel the length of the axon? So this is going to come down to all of those proteins that we drew out. They are all very close together and there are many thousands of them along the length of the axon. So we're talking about axon. There are different proteins in the dendrites and there are different proteins on the soma. But the axon has those proteins the entire length. So up here in the dendrites and on the soma, we have the stimulus, but since we don't have all those same proteins, the stimulus starts to die out the further we get away from where the stimulus was. We can see here, the further away we are, the smaller the change in voltage. But along the axon, we have the stimulus applied, but we keep having those repeating proteins to basically re-up the signal. So the signal can travel the length of the axon. It starts to kind of die out as we get further away from those proteins, but we have those next set of proteins to start the signal, the action potential again, and is passed along, 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 along the entire axon. But remember we talked about the myelin sheath and we said that it was an insulator? It electrically insulates and we said that it wraps the axon except for in those nodes of Ranvier. And in the nodes of Ranvier, the axon was exposed. And where that axon was exposed, that's where those proteins are. So we can travel through the myelin sheath without really degrading the signal any. We have those proteins here in the uh, node of Ranvier. We travel the axon and there is very little loss of signal before we get to the node of Ranvier. There are no proteins along the axon where the myelin sheath is. There doesn't need to be. So what happens is the signal, that action potential, it basically jumps from one node of Ranvier to the next. And this happens very, very quickly. So in myelinated axons, we have really, really fast conduction. And that jumping conduction that happens so fast is called saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction happens in myelinated axons and it jumps from one node of Ranvier to the next. Well, let's talk about something related to that. Let's talk about multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease and autoimmune diseases, there's all different types, but something that they all have in common is when your own immune system for some reason starts to attack a certain part of your body because it thinks that it shouldn't be there. In multiple sclerosis, the immune system starts to attack the myelin sheath and it eats the myelin sheath basically. Remember phagocytosis? Well, phagocytosis and a few other things are happening against the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath starts to degrade. If there was no myelin sheath there, what do we have? Well, we have those proteins. We have a large area where there are no proteins then a small area of proteins and a large area where there are no proteins. And as the action potential travels, since there is such a large space where there are no proteins, the signal dies before it can get to the end of the axon. Sometimes a signal will get through, most of the time it doesn't. So what happens is 
jerky movements, or paralysis. That's multiple sclerosis. Now, let's talk about local anesthetics. Local anesthetics, this is when the doctor gives you a shot and numbs a part of your body. It's very common at the dentist. It's common if you get stitches. So it's common when there is some sort of medical operation procedure that you do not have to be put to sleep for. If you are put to sleep, that's called a general anesthetic, and they work differently. But local anesthetics are something that you stay awake. It just numbs a small part of your body. How do they work? Well, local anesthetics impair voltage-gated sodium channels. Why is that important? Well, remember local, or I'm sorry, voltage-gated sodium channels, they are what start the action potential. They are what responded to threshold and opened up and caused the sodium to rush in which caused depolarization. And if you don't get depolarization, you don't get repolarization. You don't get an action potential. If you don't get action potentials, you can't send signals. So if you basically impair voltage-gated sodium channels in one part of the body, you can't send pain signals. You can't send motor signals. If you're going to the dentist, like we see here, and they impair the voltage-gated sodium channels in parts of your gums, well, they can do stuff in that area, and you never even feel it, because no action potentials. All right, that was a bit of a big lecture today. We, we haven't had a big one for a while, so let that sink in. I would recommend watching this lecture a time or two drawing those action potential illustrations out a few times. Next time we're going to see what happens when we get to the end of the axon. There's a space there. How do you send electricity over open space? Well, we'll find that out next time. And hopefully you all enjoyed this one. This is one of my favorite topics of the semester. Hopefully you all thought that it was interesting and learned something from it. As you're watching it, be sure to text or email those questions. Don't just let it go because not only are action potentials with us for the rest of the semester, they carry over into next semester. So make sure that they make sense. Don't move on until they do. All right, take care and I will talk to you next time.